Hallelujah. All right, I'm going to start reading from verse 1 uh, of the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It said, Do we begin again to commend ourselves, or need we as some others epistles of commendation to you, or letters of commendation from you? Um, the Apostle Paul, um, but let's, let's skip reading. Ye are epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So saying that the brethren actually uh, are the ones that the, the work of the Lord that you do says a lot about your, um, how, how to put it now. That is your um, your appraisal report. The report as to who you are, are the people that you raise in the Lord. That's what he's trying to say here. All right. Here are epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God's word. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. I think I've gone ahead of myself. Let's go back. Now, when he was talking about commendation and stuff like that, he was trying to infer the fact that the brethren who people could see would attest to their ministry. Hallelujah. That was why he said that we don't begin again to commend ourselves or need we as some others epistles of commendation or letters of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you to other people. Hallelujah. Yeah, our epistles written in our hearts, known and read of all men. Praise the Lord. Now, the revelation begins to flow, and it says, For as much as ye have manifestly declared to be the letters of Christ ministered by us, that's like saying we have written a letter, but that letter is a human being, and that human being is walking around and, you know, uh, being a testimony to what God is doing or has done. Amen? Through us. It is written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God's word, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves. We're not sufficient of ourselves. You know, we don't operate by our own resources. Not that we depend on ourselves. Hallelujah. We, our sufficiency is of God. If we seem to exist and prosper and thrive, it is because of God. That's what he's saying. Hallelujah. Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament or the New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter will kill it, but the Spirit giveth life. Now, I'm going to say something here about now, he's talking about themselves, him being a minister, but I'm, that's not really what is important to us as much as what he's saying. Praise the Lord. All right. He says that God has made us ministers, us made him, and us who preach the gospel under the New Testament, ministers of the spirit, not of the letter. He says, for the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Now, he's saying here that you know, sometimes the scripture, if it's preached without revelation, all right, you just hear the letter of the word rather than the true meaning that conveys life. Praise the Lord. Um, if you get the letter of the word, it will kill. But the life or the meaning that God wants to convey is what gives life. And that is why it's important that you have the whole body of truth. You don't just read a part of a scripture and run with it. People get destroyed doing that. It's important that you get the whole body of truth. All right? Like it says that 
wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Now, if you take that scripture like that and just run with it, a man can go crazy on his family. There have been times when unbelievers know that scripture. All the scripture they know is that scripture. And so with it, they compel their wives to do things that are not of God, even stop them from serving God altogether. Now, the authority that God gives anyone in the kingdom is limited to the fact that that person is using it for God's purpose. If that person seeks to drive the children of God out of the kingdom of God, their authority comes to an end. Praise the Lord. That needs to be very clear. All right? If, if somebody says to you, um, um, you know, let us go after other gods, all right? Then we won't go. Um, we will not go. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter 13, verse 2. Let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 13. All right. And see what the... Yeah, we're reading from verse 1, Deuteronomy chapter 13. Um, now, it says there from verse 1, If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and give it thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spoke unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or to that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye, ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice. And ye shall serve him and cleave unto him. And that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall thou put to death, because he had spoken to you, he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to trust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shall thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is in thine own, or which is thine own soul, and ties thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods which thou hast not known. Thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nay unto thee, or far off from thee, from one end of the earth, even unto the other end of the earth. Thou shalt not consent unto him, or hearken unto him, neither shall thy eye pity him, neither shall thou spare, neither shall thou conceal him. Praise the Lord. You won't hide what that person has said. Praise the Lord. When that person wants to lead you away from the Lord, you should not hearken to the person. Amen? Now, are we under the law? No. Why am I reading from the law if we are not under the law? Because you're going to come across people who are going to say, uh, but pastor, we are not under the law. Um, I don't know why you're reading from the law. We are, the law has been abrogated and we should not do anything from the law. All right? Um, I'm going to show you something a little bit. All right? First Timothy chapter 1. Praise the Lord. Now, verse, verse 5. First Timothy chapter 1. Verse 5, it says, Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned, which means not a put on. You're not just trying to pretend to be to have faith. You need to have it. 
from which some having swayed have turned aside unto vain janglings or jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. But we know that the law is good. We know if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for men slayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, homosexuals, for men stealers, for liars, for pejored persons. If there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. So if I see something that is contrary to sound doctrine, uh, and the person is insisting that they are right, we will go to the law. All right? Now I'm going to call another witness. Praise the Lord. Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit, verse 22, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such, there is no law. Hallelujah. Against such, there is no law. Hallelujah. All right? So, if you walk in the Spirit, you are not under the law. Because the law of the Spirit of life has made us free from the law of sin and death, which is the law of Moses which is also the canon law, which is also the principle that produces sin and death. All right? Evidenced by the law. Now, we have seen clearly that if somebody does something to lead you away from Christ, you should not accept that. Amen? Whether it's a father or your mom or your daughter or your son, I know in America, uh, uh, children lead their parents. It's where the children go, that's where the parents go. They call it good parenting. Um, to a point, it's okay, but you gotta know where your kid is leading you to. If they're not leading you right, apply the brakes and say, son, I love you, but I ain't going that route with you. Uh, let's go some other direction. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. So, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Now, I was trying to qualify that or say those things that are qualified the word of God. Now, when he says that, he's talking about the fact that there should be order in the home for you to be subject to him. All right? There should be order in the home. Now, I'm not talking about where two, two women, uh, one has... Uh, a, but who have gender identity problems. I'm not talking about that. Those ones need some psychiatric help. They don't know that yet, but you know, I need help from the Lord. Now that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, you know, I'm talking about God ordained marriages. I'm talking about a man and his wife, amen? And so God in tampering, he said to the man, love your wives, amen? Love your wives. That way, he has tampered it so that it will work. Amen? It will work. Because if the man becomes, if he says, husbands, abuse your wives, and wives obey your husbands, there will be a problem. Do you get what I'm saying? All right? So the letter kill it, the spirit gives life. God has tampered the whole body. The word of God shows us rules for man's relationship with one another and with him. Amen? Now, don't say, if he loves me, then I will obey him. If he doesn't love me, I will not obey him. That's not what the word of God says. You'll be punished for not obeying him. And he'll be punished for not loving you. 
God doesn't spare <laughs> anybody because he says something about another person. Doesn't work like that. We can see that from Genesis, from the book of Genesis, okay? In the book of Genesis, the Bible tells us how that Eve said, uh, he said to, to, Ad, uh, to, uh, to Adam, what is this that thou hast done? He said, the woman you gave me. And he asked the woman, why did you do it? He said, the snake, you know, the serpent deceived me and I did it. Now, he started punishing them one after the other. He, what, did anybody escape? Nobody escaped. Nobody. He didn't say, okay, wow, because the snake did it, I punished the snake, I leave the woman. No. He punished the snake. After that, he punished the woman. After that, he punished the man. Praise the Lord. So you, you don't use excuses to exonerate yourself. The best thing to do when you make a mistake is to own up and ask God to forgive you. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, but if the ministration of death, verse 7, written and engraved in stones was glorious. What's the ministration of death? He's and written and engraved in stones. He's talking about the, the Ten Commandments that Moses, you know, that God carved out and gave to Moses. That's what he's talking about. That is, that's what he's talking about when he talks about engraved in stones. Amen? Now, if that ministry or ministration is called the ministration of death. The reason is that the law was not made, was not created, or God did not bring the law so that people can leave. The law was designed to make sin evident. Because where there is no law, there cannot be a transgression, even though there was transgression. So God had to bring the law so that it would become evident that sin exists or existed. Praise the Lord. So, and when sin becomes the consciousness of sin, produces death. When you get to know that, you know, um, the, 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 the Apostle Paul said that he never converted until he heard thou shalt not covet. And then he found himself converting like crazy. And then because of that, sin used the law, which was righteous, to deceive him and by it slew him. That's why it's called the ministration of death. Hallelujah. Now, it says, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away with. I read it completely. It says, but if the ministration of death, written and engraved in stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses, for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? What is he talking about? Now, in the day that Moses received the law, he was up in the mountain with God for 40 days. And at the end of those 40 days, when he came out, when he came down from the mountain, it, uh, Moses' face was shining with the glory of God. Praise the Lord. And so he says that if that ministration, if that law had some glory to the point of it being seen on Moses and the miracles that he did, how much more shall the ministration of life? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. If that ministration had some glory, how would the ministration of the Spirit be like? What would it be like? What would the power, the revelation, what would the out expression, the outward expression of the ministry of the Spirit of God how is it going to be if what was a law that ministered death had that kind of glory in front of Moses because Moses stood in the presence of God? Praise the Lord. You know, Moses did not have the indwelling Holy Spirit. What would not happen if the new creation has an encounter with God in such a way that we go into that kind of place, we'll come out like Jesus? Totally glorified. Hallelujah. For if the ministration of condemnation be glory. Why is it called condemnation? It was designed so that sin will become evident and men will become 
guilty. That's why it's called condemnation, the, the, the administration of condemnation. Praise the Lord. Because God brought the law so that sin can become evident. He didn't create the law so that men may be righteous. He created the law so that men may become guilty. Praise God. All right? Now, much more do with the ministration of righteousness. So what we have is the ministration of righteousness exceeding glory. Hallelujah. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelled. He's been giving it a lot of names. It says the ministration of the spirit, the ministration of righteousness, the ministration of the glory that excelled. Praise the Lord. So you have glory that excels, all right? Did I get it right? Even that which was made glorious, who had no glory in this respect, by reason of the glory that excelled. Yeah. The ministry of the Spirit, ministry of righteousness, and the glory that excels. All right? So all of that is talking about Christ, the ministry of the Spirit, the ministry of life that came through Jesus Christ. Amen? For if that which is done away... The law was done away, was glorious, had some measure of the demonstration of the power of God. Much more that which is which remained is glorious. It remains because it abides forever. Amen. It abides forever. That's why it's called when it says remain it. It's talking about the fact that the ministry that we have. The life we have received from God, we received eternal life. That life remains forever. Amen? Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Hallelujah. When we preach the gospel, we don't use high falutin words. We use just plain, simple words that men can flow with and understand. We try to break it down. In simple words, so that people can get it. Hallelujah. Now it says, verse 13 says that, Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished, but their minds were blinded. For until this day remained the same veil, untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. Amen. For even unto this day, when Moses is read, that is the law. When it's read, the veil is upon their hearts. If, if you notice something, when you're reading the scriptures, if you're reading the Old Testament, it looks a bit shrouded in some kind of stuff. All right? When you come into the New Testament, it's easier to understand and to flow with. Do you get you know, and, and what the Lord was saying, or what the Apostle Paul was saying here, is that that happened because when Moses came down from the mountain, the people said to him, dude, your face is shining, mate. Cover your face. I mean, you're just like us, you know, you're looking like an angel. It's like light is just coming out of your face. You need to cover it a little bit. So Moses put a veil over his face. And when he did that, Rather than people be exposed to the light of God's glory, it was hidden from them. And because of that, the spirit which should have been, you know, the Bible says that uh, the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. There's something about the truth there. The truth there is talking about how things really are or the works that accompany the manifestation. So, it tells us really what we should do, how God is. Amen? The Bible says that, the, that God seeks, that God is a spirit, and they that shall worship him, shall worship him in spirit and in truth. Amen? So, that is, that is what, um, the truth there is reality as God really is. And the works that accompany that reality. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So that veil is over there, and that veil is done away when we come to Christ. Hallelujah. 
Now, but their minds was blinded unto this, they remained that same veil on taking away the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when we shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be or turn to the Lord, turn to the Lord, or turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit. The Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, hallelujah. If we read Christ, the veil is taken away and things are plain. Hallelujah. Because we're able to look at God, behold his glory. And let, let's read it further down. It says, but we all with open faces, beholding us in a glass, the glory of God are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of God. It says, now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, but we all, with open face, beholding us in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are changing the same glory, the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now we will, hallelujah, amen. Now, I'm going to read something. Um, when it says, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, I know that a lot of times we think that uh, it means partially, in the basic form, that if I want to run in the presence of God, I can run. If I want to do anything, I can. What it just means is that there is freedom to express God. There is freedom to express the Lord, the nature of God, free from bondage. It's just saying that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom from bondage. Freedom from the desire to do what is wrong. You know, when the Spirit of God is moving, you find out that you, and you're in the, in the flow of God, the things of this world don't really entice you much. And that is why in fellowship, things don't, when you're in fellowship with the people of God, and you stick with the people of God, your life will be different than if you isolate yourself and you're by yourself. Amen. Hallelujah. So where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Amen? Now, but we all with open face, beholding us in the glass, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. Beholding us in a glass. The word glass there actually means mirror. Praise the Lord. So when we look at God, we are, we understand that we are like him. We are made, we have been born again. We are no longer who we were. And so we have a new nature and that nature is the nature of God. The new creature that is in us is a son of God. And so as we begin to learn about God and how he is, we are transformed into the same image. Hallelujah. Because as he is, so are we in this world. Hallelujah. It says, when it talks about mirror, it's also talking about his radiating glory. So like just that veil that was in front of Moses and the people were looking at it and it could have changed their lives, we see Jesus Christ, we see God in, in Christ. Hallelujah. Bible says, God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Hallelujah. When he says he's the express image of the Father. Amen. So when we behold that glory, we are, we can see ourselves in him. That's what it's supposed to be. We can see ourselves in Christ. And then we begin to 
change and become more and more like him. More and more like him. He casts out devils, we cast out. Hallelujah. He accepts stuff, we accept. If Jesus did not engage in brawling, you know, putting down his Bible and punching out people and slapping them around, if he didn't do that, when we get into a situation where we feel upset to the point where we want to do that, because Jesus didn't do that, we won't do that. Now, he did not accept people being abusive of God. He wanted people to honor the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, why would us seeing his glory matter except we're like him? The eagle does not learn to be an eagle from an elephant. A human being does not learn to be a human being from a cat. He or she watches how other human beings behave and conducts himself accordingly. That is in the general sense. Hallelujah. God is love. We are love. Amen. We walk in love. That's why sometimes when we do some stuff, some people think that we are stupid. You know? Why? Because their hearts are hardened. So... What God is trying to do, they can misread it. Praise the Lord. When people show you love in the house of God, it does not mean that they have any ulterior motive. They don't. Don't read it to mean that. Does that make sense? We ask a brother to follow you up. They call you. He likes me. He's always calling me. No. Don't get carried away with stuff like that. Now, we love you. That's better than like. But it's the love of God. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. We won't have it any other way. You're our sister and our brother. Now, God will always find one person somewhere who goes over and beyond. That's for those who are not married and, you know, sees you more special than everybody else and wants to keep you for himself. That's okay. All right. If he's going to marry you, that's okay. Now, if he's a crook, that's not okay. Yeah. If he's going about, you know, breaking hearts all over the place, that's not okay. We are to recognize who we are and to learn to live according to our new nature in Christ Jesus. Amen? Because we're born of God's word. We're born of the... Uh, 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 of the ever-living word of God. Hallelujah. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 15, the Bible says, Whosoever shall confess, shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, or God dwells in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwells in love, or dwelleth in love, dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. You know, let me say this to you. How many, how many of you here saw Trading Places? There was a movie that came out some way back. Maybe some of you were not born at the time, but... You know, <laughs> okay. yeah. So now, what happened actually was that somebody had some millionaire was playing some joke and took a guy on the streets and made him treat places with a well-polished, groomed guy who was supposed to take over the business empire because he was married to his daughter. Now, this guy. They, they betted one dollar that they could make a street guy into groom him and make him, um, polish him up and make him, uh, a, 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 what do you call him, like a yuppie or whatever, an upcoming executive. They can make him an executive and take an executive and make him a criminal. So that's what they did. They traded places. So Eddie Murphy was the guy who was supposed to be the guy on the streets that they brought in. So when they brought him into the home, I said, this is your home. He started stealing the gold and whatever he started. And they said, look, dude, you can't steal your own stuff. 
After a while, he got used to the idea of being the big shot. And so he stopped trying to steal from himself. When God brought us into the kingdom, he said, Ye are my sons and daughters. And all authority in heaven and earth had been given to Jesus. And Jesus turned around and gave us the authority. I said, look, I'm checking out. I'm going to heaven. You guys exercise authority on my behalf. Amen. And so God begins to walk through us and with us. And he put his word in our mouths that he might plant the heavens and the earth. Amen. Hallelujah. So... It's good that we, we understand those things. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. So when you read the word of God, don't read it as that the word is supposed to be judging or condemning you. No. The word and you are the same. Just learn what he says and flow with it. You know, like there are, if, if you don't read the word of God for some time, including us who, who are ministers, we begin to form opinions in our heads. In fact, that opinion can actually come from the Bible, but it's, it's wrong. When a staff meeting and something came up, and in, in the short run while we're talking, I, an opinion came up in my mind as to how I should handle it. And as I left and I went back home and I slept, in my, in my sleep state, the Lord started ministering to my spirit. Because there was something I said I was not going to be able to, I'm not going to pray about. You know, some people did some things and I said, look, I'm not going to, anybody can pray, I'm not going to pray. Now, in the night, the Holy Ghost began to bring back things to me and said, son, consider this. I was sleeping. Now, I was sleeping, but he was talking to me. Because your sleep, your spirit man does not sleep. Your body can sleep, but your spirit man does not sleep. And that is why if you're sensitive to the spirit, if someone, if a creature, not of God, walks into your room, you wake up. You will know that something came around you, and you wake up. It comes from prayer, you know. If you don't pray at all, don't worry. You won't notice Jack. <laughs> so he was talking to me and said, remember Moses. Remember Samuel. I said, that's true. Samuel said, I will not sin against God by stopping or refusing or ceasing to pray for you. So I knew that that decision I took there, though it was based on some scripture, was incorrect because God had an exact word for that situation. Do you understand? Praise the Lord. So God, as we read the word, we adjust our lives in line with the word. The world watching us, the Bible says that when we obey God, it is our wisdom before the nations. And that's how they see Christ in us. Like the Bible says, don't say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow when you have that thing the person needs by you. When we do it, we're obeying the word of God, but it's creating an image of God about us to the world. But what we're doing, we're just obeying scriptures. Do you understand? It changes how people see you. But what are you doing? You're just obeying words that you heard. Hallelujah. Maybe your you your 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 an uncle and your your you know or an auntie or whatever and your 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 so that person's relative passed on or you are a cousin a distant cousin and the relative passed on and you were supposed you had some things that belonged to that relative 
And you're supposed to pass it on to the children. When you read, you know, sometimes the temptation can come up. Say, dude, he gave it to me many years ago and they've forgotten about it. Maybe I should keep it. All right? And the Holy Ghost does something to you and says, do not enter into the heritage of the orphan. For his Redeemer is mighty and he will contend with you. Because of that scripture, you hand over the things to them. Well, what do they say about you? Wow. That is a Christian with integrity. They don't know all the things that happen. But they just know that your action flows in line with God. How did you know that? You were looking at the mirror and seeing how God wanted you to act. And you acted accordingly. That's how God does things for us. Amen. We're looking at the word. It says, be angry, but don't sin. And so, before if I used to get angry and I'd curse people out, and I'll fight and I'll brawl and I'll slap people around. Now I get angry and God says, don't sin. So I can't do that anymore. I withhold that part of it. If I used to be somebody who was slothful in business, people commit a job into my hands to do. And I don't do it. And I want to collect the money for it. You know, that is being a crook. How many of you know that? They give you a job to do, you don't do it, and you want to collect the money. That's a crook. I get to find out that the word of God says, not slothful in business. So I get to do the work properly. After I've done it, then I'll ask for my money. Hallelujah. And when you're doing stuff, when you're building, they call you to build. You do the right things. There was, there was, I'll close with this. There was this, this builder. And he had been building for this man, for his father-in-law, for so many years. He had been building for him. And then this final project that they had, he was getting to the time where, you know, the father-in-law, um, was he a businessman or his father-in-law? I'm not quite sure which one it was. So the guy asked him to build a, a, a final house for him before he leaves, father-in-law, okay, before he leaves and all of that. So this guy bought all the substandard products. He said, make sure you put the best in there. The guy says he's going to put the best. And an evil thought came into his heart. All these other times he had been doing things well. This time, he built the thing in such a way he took all the inferior stuff for the insulation and stuff like that. So that, and this was a very cold region. Maybe it's Colorado or one of these places. And this guy, whoa, all the inferior stuff he put in there. The electrical wiring in the place was a mess. So he thought he was saving money. At the end of the day, the man now said, handed the keys of that home to him and said, this is my gift to you and my daughter. Whoa. Whoa. Hallelujah. You see why it's not good to do stuff like that? Be yourself. Be of God. True and true. Amen? Yeah. Because you never know what will come out of it. You can imagine that somebody loaned you their car and you treated it anyhow and you brought it to the place where by the time they kick it the next day, the engine was going to knock. And so they call you and say, the keys are yours, the car is yours. And just as you're driving out of the driveway, the engine goes Wah! and that's it. <laughs> You used it. <laughs> now they're giving it to you. Hallelujah. If you rent a home, leave it in a better state than you met it. You're not doing it for, say, why should, why should I do that for these wicked people? You know, and you, 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 you do some things that nobody would notice immediately. Maybe that after two years that you've left the place, then the wall fall out. 
the world falls out. And they say, what? What happened here? Then they can't come back to you, but you knew what you did there. You knew. That's not how to be a Christian. Because we are light. Hallelujah. The Bible says God is good and he doeth good. So everything I'm, you do must be good. Let it be good. When people check you out, be right. Amen? You know, sometimes it, it becomes even more difficult sometimes these days to, you know, when I'm dealing with the Christians, even in the office, when we're dealing in the office, and I'm, tr- I'm, being me- I'm going out of my way to be thorough and meticulous. Some of the brethren that work in church, some of our you know, staff and all the people are telling, no, 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 let's not go into all that, you know. Let's just, you know, we, we, brethren, it doesn't matter, you know. <laughs> I've learned quite some stuff. Do you understand that sometimes you know, people have church face. You know what church face is? Very holy. When you touch them, then things start coming out. Let me tell you something. If you do business with anyone, Christian, or non-Christian, make sure that you document stuff. Are you listening? Make sure that your contract is to the letter. In fact, write it as if you were dealing with a demon. Operate it like an angel that you are. Are you listening? Um, what I'm telling you now, some of you are not paying attention. Even if you're in elementary school, I know we don't have elementary schoolers here, middle schoolers, right? Learn from now to be thorough. If, before you put your signature down, read it. Read it. You can't sign and say, oh, I did not know that was what they meant. No. And let me say something else to you that you need to know. When they say on paper, for each day you don't show up, you're going to give us $500. And they say, no, that's not what it really means. It means that, you know, we're just trying to stop you from doing it. We're not really going to implement it. Don't agree with that. Don't sign it. The minute you sign it, at the, on the day they're going to implement it, the person you spoke with will suddenly disappear. <laughs> Listen, I bought a few cars in this city. When, I, when you're coming from Nigeria or Africa, you tend to think that every, every American is honest. and every, There are criminals here, here, here. Real serious, advanced criminals. They're here. The guys in Africa are still learning. They are still apprentices to some criminals that are here. And they wear good suits, smile a lot, you know, and they scam you. This guy told me all kinds of stuff. I was buying a vehicle brand new. He was telling me, look, you do this, you do that, you do that. Now, I came six months down the line to implement the situation. I said, look, you know, these sales guys, they tell you whatever they want to tell you. What is on the paper? I said, I said, but he told me that what was on paper was not, you know, what I was going to. Where's the sales guy? Gone. I was so upset with myself. I said, if he was in Nigeria, I will read it thoroughly. But I'm here. And I thought the guy was honest. From that day, I made up my mind, whatever he looks like or she looks like, whether they're soft-spoken or they were shouting and screaming when they were saying it, I will read it thoroughly because writing is the real man. 
my mom used to say, writing is the real man. All that thing they're telling you, if they don't reduce it to writing, is what is written in the final analysis that would speak. Now, does God, some people say that's being legalistic. Mm. The devil is, realist, is legalistic. God is legalistic. The angels are legalistic. Is legal is the legality? What do you have? What is yours? What does the contract say is yours? You can sign literally sign away your life and not know it. How is how is it that people who don't have money in America get to buy cars paying far more than the rich? Why they don't read the contract? A lot of these cars you buy from these dealers are designed for you to not be able to pay for it and they come for the vehicle and keep your money and keep their vehicle. When they were writing it, they knew you were not going to be able to pay for it. Are you listening? So you got to sign your contracts bearing all these things in mind. Amen? 